So today we're going to be talking about application of data science in financial services. Um, I thought it would be a, a nice um, sort of a, a start of these lunch on sessions with a um, topic that may have not been touched much in the data science space and the, and the big data. Um, so just have a little bit of a different view um, on the application of data science. And just let me try to find my, here we go, my video. Sorry, Sean, just a second. Okay. Just want to make sure if anyone joins, um, then I can let them in. All right, so it's going to be a nice an hour, um, easy session, just an hour. And um, I think it uh, would be nice to have your um, you know, input at points as well. So I will ask you a few questions if you're okay with that. Um, and um, probably that would be a good example of showing how we can apply data science in financial services. So um, my background is in um, finance. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about myself and then um, the application of data science. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my background is in uh, financial services and project management. Um, I've done my bachelor in mathematics. So at the time that data wasn't a big, um, you know, buzzword, um, I did my uh, my uh, bachelor in pure mathematics, which was understanding you know different type of um, algorithm and um, and uh, quite complex you know theories um, and. At the time, I didn't think much about the application of, um, you know, mathematics in data science as it's um, kind of, it's um, popular now. So it was a little bit more abstract and it was a little bit more on the kind of academic side of it rather than the practical side. Whereas now it's really nice and refreshing to see that um, all those different ideas and um, mathematical you know, theories can be actually, um, you know, applied in almost day-to-day -day problems and um, solve um, businesses, you know, problems and issues and um, bringing new ideas. Um, then from there, I did my master's in finance. That's the kind of topic comes um, um, in, into the plate um, this morning or this afternoon, rather. So talking about the finance, so I did my master in finance. That's how I kind of started getting interested in the application of data science into finance and specifically in decision making that's um, my area of interest and that's then from that following into um, approaching and pursuing my further education in, uh, in a higher um, degree um, and a PhD in behavioral finance so again understanding of um, the application of um, uh, the social science or a human science into um, the finance and also uh, being able to run different, you know, research and modeling and prediction and try to understand how people, um, you know, behave and make decisions at a certain point in time, especially around their financial decisions. In terms of uh, my career, so I've got over 15 years in corporate um, in different kind of capacities. Um, I've done project management and risk management, hence um, um, I'm hoping that I can bring the community together and applying that sort of a stakeholder management. So um, I'm encouraging everyone to um, please feel free to reach out anytime if I can help you in any shape or form. Send me a message if you've got any idea that you'd like to share it on the platform uh, and the roundtable community, please feel free to reach out to me and share your idea. Um, I've done investment advice. Um, advice and um, that's the kind of application of data science in understanding um, different um, risk appetite, how you actually identify people's um, risk tolerances and running questionnaires and doing research. And also um, remediation and compliance. It was very interesting to, um, as much as it may sound very kind of far away from a whole data science um, or a usual data science um, topic, but the re remediation and compliance was quite interesting that you could see patterns in people's behavior that if one case was uh, breaching, you know, um, few of the compliance requirements, you could see time and time again with the same advisor or the same person, the same kind of behavior happens. So you could actually model it and then you get to the point of in terms of risk management that is this person potentially a risk to the 
um, organization in terms of the compliance risk and how we can mitigate risk. Um, and also um, it would be in terms of the um, kind of so put some sort of a predictive modeling that how could we actually understand the compensation from a customer point of view if certain behavior has happened, what would be um, the cost to the organization to be able to remediate those actions. Um, and I also worked in a fintech company, which was um, a startup um, working um, in an age pension space, uh, which is a very niche market. Um, I think it's enough about myself. Um, let's um, yeah, get more into the topic, which is um, my passion and area of interest. And I hope that I can um, ignite some you know, inspiration and interest in, um, in our community as well. Um, so a little bit about our community, Sean, do you wanna to touch on that or um, talk a little bit about what is analytics round table? Yeah, sure. So I guess analytics table round table is um, about bringing people together to share ideas, um, to create new connections and to work more collaboratively. Um, it's really just a community, um, but the platform itself provides a number of different tools for people to be enabled around those things. Um, so I guess, um, Haria, thank you for being sort of the host of this community, um, because I think that's going to really enable people to really come together. And um, this session itself is sort of a lunchtime session to really start to share some of those ideas. Um, so I think if anyone is interested in sharing thoughts or ideas around different topics or by industry, then, um, you know, reach out to Haria and we can definitely make that happen. Um, a lot of this is sort of sponsored by the community. So um, it's really sort of working out how we can enable individuals. Um, it's not really commercial in nature. Um, it's about how we can really enable in this time where individuals might be struggling in this space. There's sort of a lacking of networking or conference events and due to COVID-19. And I think moving forward, um, this platform could really accelerate how people work um, in the years to come. Um, it was a very interesting um, point, Sean. I think it's very timely, at the, uh, especially around at, at this time that, um, you know, self-isolation and isolation and quarantine and all of that. And it's more um, and social distancing. So it's all about, you know, um, people just um, physically being away from each other. So it's a great opportunity to bring everyone back again in a kind of virtual setup in a, in a, in a, in a platform, in a safe environment that is professional and collaborative and uh, in a respectful manner that everyone can um, share their ideas and be open about, you know, different um, feedback, different, um, you know, suggestions, and we all grow together and empower each other. Definitely. And um, I was just going to say, as part of your introduction, um, as a data scientist, a lot of the work is, especially around data wrangling, and when you get actually some time to do some modeling, um, it's really from the ground up. Um, I think, um, thank you for this presentation, um, because you bring a unique experience around um, understanding behavior, which is sort of that part of the business equation in understanding what key variables might actually work. Um, what is a practical lever that I can pull to drive improvement in a particular outcome? Um, I think when we get to executing that within the business, um, a lot of these types of projects don't necessarily have the success um, because they're lacking in some of those areas. Um, so understanding how people make decisions and understanding the behavior and the process around that is really important to how you drive more effective decision making within organizations and then how you can sort of make quite successful data science initiatives and projects out of that. So I think this is really insightful and something that I haven't seen before. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, I'm sure it was a nice segue to our next slide. Um, so a little bit of a background about um, how analytics can help us adapt, adapt to and thrive in a much more competitive environment. Um, so how do we enable a decision-making capability that takes hours and stuff weeks? So I think, um, Shona, and if um, you don't mind, I'm gonna be kind of uh, coming back to you on that as um, you've got a lot of experience in that space, especially around um, you know, decision-making capability and um, at 
your um, sort of level on day to day basis, you need to make certain decisions, um, whether it would be a business um, or um, in terms of the strategic as in long term, what the business is um, kind of um, the direction of the business and where they are going in the future. Um, so um, just a quick kind of um, walk through this slide. So on the left hand side, I'm just going to make it a little bit bigger for myself um, so I can actually see it. <laughs> um, and the, on the left hand side, we are talking about um, the environment is changing and becoming more complex. I think um, especially after going through COVID-19 situation, I think we all can agree that we definitely live in an uncertain um, you know, time that um, the change is the only constant and how we can actually um, leverage our skills and how we can tap into the um, knowledge of data scientists and uh, data to be able to drive um, useful insights and timely insight that it can help us to make the right decision um, at, the, at the right time, especially around um, the, the uncertain time that we can't necessarily think too far ahead. Um, for example, in terms of the, and I, I'll kind of bring it back into the finance and Sean, please feel free to step in and, and bring that kind of data um, lens into it. Um, in terms of the uncertain environment and the changing environment, um, we all gone through a very uh, volatile, um, even evolving um, time um, since the whole COVID started that a lot of businesses had to quickly adopt a new way of um, running their businesses, engaging with clients, even this Zoom session that we have now. Um, and people are more um, flexible in terms of how they make um, you know, their own um, communications and how they are making their decision on a daily basis. Around the finances, it was a little bit tricky because you have to be able to communicate with your you know, clients and for the, for example, banks and financial institutions with the customers. Um, in a time that it's very, um, it hasn't happened in the past, maybe uh, this extent. Um, so there hasn't been any kind of precedent of it. And it's very hard for, um, for customers probably to kind of adopt the new system and the new technology and communicate. So a lot of um, decision making in a kind of high level might be around how we can engage with our clients and customers and keep them still, um, you know, uh, engage and involve in their uh, in their finance financial matters um, without kind of losing them using too much of the technology and <clears throat> around this time I think one of the things that I first had experience with was um, around data security and um, also and data management which I will tap into it um, as we go through different um, aspect of um, data science in, in financial services. But Sean, if, I, if you don't mind, I'm just going to come to you on that. Um, what has been your experience in terms of, um, you know, it's very changing environment that we are in it at the moment and how it has impacted, um, you know, your area? Yeah, I guess um, there's probably two streams and there is a gap in between those streams. There are organizations that use data very effectively and um, they've really matured a stack over the past four years without necessarily pivoting to other technology to develop a really good strategic capability. And there are other organizations that uh, are still building up that capability. Um, effective data science, and I think you're right in, in how you look at value is, is based on that foundation. And um, I think you mentioned um, data security and data management playing increasingly important roles um, because a lot of this has also become quite political in how people use data, especially within financial services. Um, I remember watching a um, recent Netflix um, series, um, The Social Dilemma, and it sort of highlighted um, sort of a view around how Facebook operates. And, you know, that creates a lot of uncertainty and a lot of criticism in how data is used that in terms of those two dimensions, the organizations that aren't performing that well with data, it sort of sets them back a little bit. Um, they have a need to build this foundation and to look at data science capabilities. They also need to look at 
the social dilemma around how they use that information, especially within financial services. And then you have organizations like Amazon who are going full stream ahead and utilizing that capability to increasing their market share in quite an uncertain economic environment that we're in at the moment. So it sort of creates a unfair scenario for a lot of organizations that want to enter into this space. But also, I think there is a balancing there, as you mentioned, around looking at the ethical concerns as well. Um, so I think it's quite a challenging time to get all these things right. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think um, um, this slide um, kind of like summarize what you just uh, talked about in terms of the value of um, those infrastructure and maybe early on adaption of the data science and big data and having the right skill um, skill set and tools and infrastructure in organizations. So when the um, you know uncertain time happens, you are actually equipped to be able to take um, in a way take advantage of um, you know and um, the situation and turn the threat into an opportunity for your organization. Um, so I think the kind of middle part of this um, slide talks about the, the value of um, those investment in an, in an organization that eventually that can be a, um, a added value to an organization that uh, the organization with the strongest analytics um, have a higher, potentially have a higher um, investment returns, especially in the first, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the five year um, time frame, and this is the area that I am really kind of um, interested and passionate. That what is the return on investment? So um, sometimes, you know, when you are um, hiring or you are going through a restructure at the time, things may have be a little bit um, volatile and not necessarily pleasant. Um, but when you look at it, maybe long term, if there has been a plan and you know strategic thinking behind it, if you look at it long term, then it there has to be a added value to that organization and it has to be um, some sort of a projection in terms of the higher um, um, return on those in initial investments. Definitely, and I think you might um, have covered this in the future slide, uh, but um, for executives, it's looking at how you can make this process reproducible too. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of the frustration um, um, some of the community members have highlighted is the misalignment in PDs for a data scientist. Yeah. Um, so that comes in that they've actually started the role, they've been promised that they're doing all these things, but they're actually doing sort of data wrangling or typical data engineering um, types of uh, capabilities or jobs. And that sort of takes away from the value of a data scientist. Um, if they're thinking long term, they need to be paired up with other resources and, you know, resources like a data engineer type of capability where you can look at a pipeline of data. Um, they could start to model that effectively to start to create the value rather than being taken two steps backwards. And um, I guess the, um, the strategy behind that is sort of a long term planning. You're exactly right. That's a, that's a very interesting point, uh, Sean. And I think it brings it to the, to the last part of this slide that to, to be able to remain competitive, you have to invest in analytical capability. And um, where uh, to start better than, you know, hiring the best, um, you know, talent. And to be able to do that, it's providing them the right uh, sort of a platform and foundation. And that can be just as simple as, you know, job description or JD or, or a PD that, someone actually know why they are going to that organization, how they can add value, how they can grow, and how they can see themselves in the future of that organization, not just being um, sort of in and out and, and a short-term solution. Great. Um, so uh, the next one, we um, I think we already kind of touched on it, but maybe you just bring everything together in terms of the data science maturity and, and target. So, um, I kind of tap into it in terms of my experience in, in the finance space. And Sean, please, um, you know, um, feel free to kind of bring that data science and, and data lens to it. Um, so usually, um, and kind of back into my time um, when I was doing project management, when you kind of start something, it's more um, sort of a gut feeling, oh, what we're going to be doing, and try to kind of uh, brainstorm a few ideas. And you don't necessarily know what exactly you are going to be doing or what's the plan, what's the budget, what are the resources, do you have actually enough resources to do anything or not. And eventually you are kind of maturing this idea and getting to the point that, okay, 
um, I, I need, you know, for example, a data engineer and a data scientist. I need a business sort of a um, person, a business development or some business manager that actually bring every, everybody together or a business analyst. And then from that, start building up as um, what are actually our requirements in a technical term and in a business term. And then start writing different type of um, um, sort of, I call it mini kind of program or algorithms that how we can actually um, automate this ecosystem or um, these kind of functions that we are saving um, time and saving resources. And um, my um, kind of experience was shown that a lot of time um, people um, get sort of a confused between causation and correlation. And in the beginning, it may not necessarily mean much, but if you build a, a, an algorithm or a platform and, and an idea based on that and then start moving forward and then you get to the to the output and you actually don't get what you expected because the input is something totally different. Um, so in my experience, it was like when you are running, um, you know, those sort of a um, quick um, stand-ups, five minutes, everyone come and tell me what you're going to be doing, what's your idea, how are you going to get this system up and running. Sometimes we tend to rush um, into a solution mode instead of actually take a step back and see what are we trying to do here? What is actually the problem? Most of the time, we just need to analyze that problem, which brings us to that causation. What is that problem? What is, um, you know, um, causing that problem? And then we find all the factors and variables involved in it. And what is that the thing that out of all 10 variables, what are the ones that we can actually analyze, measure, or control? And then based on that, start writing a, a sort of a plan or an algorithm or a modeling. And then based on that, um, running some forecasting that if such and such happen, what's going to be, and then we can do some sort of a scenario analysis. Uh, analysis. Um, what has been your experience, Sean? Yeah, I think um, I think you highlighted something that really resonates that um, previously, where I think 30% of data science projects fail, um, or it might have been higher than that. Um, there is a lot of unsuccessful data science initiatives and projects. And um, you've highlighted a, a few areas where people just trip up on, um, where they haven't necessarily defined what the requirements are, what the objective or outcome that they want to optimize, um, or they don't necessarily have the right data or an understanding of that data. There might be poor data quality as well. Um, so I think um, where organizations tend to focus is very much to the left, um, and you know, especially within financial services as well. Um, so that left is sort of about gut feeling and sort of very much operational reports where they've got a list of key metrics that tend to be backwards looking or quite lagging um, where the value is. And I think this sort of, I think it's a Gartner model highlights quite nicely is that if we could use data uh, science initiatives, we can look at maybe combining different metrics or, um, you know, using an algorithm with some um, sort of common sense to be able to look towards predicting the future. So looking at leading indicators, um, that value is immensely powerful, um, especially right now where things have turned upside down to be able to get some understanding what the future could hold and where it could optimize certain outcomes. And um, I think in terms of technology as well, um, historically it has been an inhibitor where um, technology strategy has shifted every couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, so I sort of consider this to be like building a skyscraper. It, it takes at least five years. Um, and if you're changing every couple of years, you're not quite reaching the top of that tower. Um, and it's important to look at a complete view, which includes those foundational elements. I think lagging indicators and basic metrics are all part of the foundations. and creating a shared understanding um, of what has happened historically, that enables you to look at the next couple of years and expanding that into forward-looking indicators, which will increase the success of these projects. Yeah, very well said, um, Sean. It's very interesting that, um, as you mentioned, um, if the data foundations kind of chop and change every couple of years, you're constantly chasing 
um, you know, um, and, and you can't actually get to that destination. You're constantly moving forward without actually having that foundation set up. And it's, um, uh, you know, kind of very wobbly in a way, instead of being a solid foundation that you can actually build um, your structure on it and then moving forward. Um, and also the other thing I think is the um, new cloud-based technology um, that's starting to improve stability. So uh, improving stability of operational requirements um, uh, also will help um, organization progress to greater value add. So um, as you can see in the um, kind of in, in, in the, on the slide, more, more moving uh, to the right hand side of the slide, it's when it's a powerful strategic when you can actually uh, move from a gut feeling to more of a scientific approach and sort of a um, fundamental approach that you have done your uh, groundwork and you're building up based on your experience and knowledge moving forward. Um, I've got an uh, interesting um, question for you, Sean. So is data scientists and um, engineers are still um, having the sexiest job? <laughs> and what does that mean? <laughs> I think um, there was, was an article and if I look at the date, um, it was, oh, it's October. So um, data scientists, I think there was an article that I saw that mentioned it, that it was the, the sexiest job of the 21st century. Yeah. Um, as a data scientist, I think that's absolutely true. Um, but you sort of have competing to that view around data engineering. Um, what I've realized is that the foundations and building those foundations are so vital to the success of a data scientist that um, you need to sort of pair them up with data engineers. And um, especially as you get sort of more accurate with the models that you create. Um, I'm not a mathematician. Um, it's something that is probably too difficult for me. Um, so I really um, admire what you've gone through. Um, but um, part of the data engineers capabilities, I think will also start to evolve into the idea of feature engineering and assisting the data scientist in improving the accuracy and viability of different models. Um, so I think, you know, this is a pair made in heaven. Um, and, you know, I think the success of those projects is not just sort of the technical elements, mm -hmm. it's also the softer skills as well. So um, I think your background around um, understanding of behavior and social sciences, and change management are quite key to enabling a successful project as well. Uh, yeah, it's interesting, Sean, isn't it? That um, sometimes we just focus on one aspect, not the uh, holistic approach. And um, once you kind of marry these different skill, that's when you get the optimal um, sort of outcome. Um, when you have the, the full picture or a bigger um, kind of picture or a bigger vision rather than just maybe one project at a time and what um, and a short term kind of goals um, although those short term goals um, if they are planned um, strategically well they have to align and kind of fit into the long term goals um, at the end um, so the data science is getting easier and um, obviously now compared to maybe five years ago, Sean, would that be fair to say that a lot of different new kind of platforms, tools, um, softwares have been, um, you know, introduced and it's a much more competitive environment now compared to maybe five or, or 10 years ago. Um, and the, um, the requirements of a data scientist is growing as well. So um, have you had any experience with any of this tool, um, the Amazon, um, SageMaker or a um, data um, robot? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, both of those tools. Um, so I think what you highlighted before, um, sort of cloud-based technologies, and these are both um, sort of software as a service offering, um, are really making things efficient. Um, so I guess the traditional data scientist five years ago, um, you know, background um, sort of a you know, bit of statistics, algorithms, programming languages, combining Python, um, a lot of that can start to be automated within those types of tools where you've got a graphical user interface and you're dragging and dropping different data sets. And um, especially with data robot um, more recently, um, it's actually comparing thousands of different algorithms and depending on the parameters that you select, it actually optimizes to select the best algorithm. 
So usually that process um, does take a lot of technical knowledge and it's starting to automate that technical knowledge. Um, the cartoon that you have is very funny, um, you know, where, a, where a data science might be the sexiest role, um, you know, he's actually walking away with a robot. Um, it's quite funny. Um, so I think where we need to look towards is how do you diversify your skills? Isn't that, isn't that right? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think that's maybe that's why I'm here today in this session, because um, you come from different sort of a background from finance, from, um, you know, mathematics or data science, project management. And throughout your career, you um, learn and obtain different type of skill and even micro skill that um, you kind of take it with you. And at some point you may um, sort of put some of them in an incubator and then they become your primary um, skill and then you kind of build upon that or you may just park it at some point and try to learn new skill and new um, um, sort of tools. And, um, and I think that comes to back to your comment that we need to uh, be able to diversify our kind of portfolio if I can <laughs> take from my finance um, you know, terminology in a way that you are um, mitigating any risk as being just um, specialized in one area. It would be good to be able to kind of diversify your portfolio and be able to um, not a sort of a, um, um, in a everything a little bit, but specialize maybe in one, two, three main area that you think that they are aligned with each other. So once you learn some sort of a skill, it can actually fit into the other one and they kind of help each other to grow rather than kind of con contradicting or conflicting. Definitely. Um, we are almost um, halfway through our session. So I'm just going to um, um, stick to our, <laughs> our slides for a little bit. Um, although I, I, I'm really enjoying this chat and please um, step in at any point. Um, so the next one we are talking about, um, we just talked about, you know, communications, behavior and change man management. And I think this um, slide is uh, bringing everything together perfectly that um, how different, um, you know, aspect of data science um, and data science project, um, how they can actually be successful if the overlap has been managed um, properly and also the gaps between each area. Um, so um, it's, for example, the data science partnering with the data engineers to be able to automate and um, the hacking skills and, um, and also domain experts or um, within finance, for example, this could be um, someone, you know, um, like myself from a finance background to be able to talk to um, someone from a data like yourself and, and see what are the potential and opportunities between the two industry that they can help each other out. Um, and just a quick kind of example was uh, the very last um, project I was involved was um, sort of a, um, working on this AI and one of the companies that I was working to be able to run um, some sort of an algorithm to read text and to be able to kind of highlight and red flag all the compliance issues. And um, for the developers and the data engineers and data scientists, they wouldn't be able to just sit down in isolation and give a big you know, book of compliance and go through it. We needed to have that collaboration to be able to, um, from um, our point of view, what is the compliance risk and what are the uh, red flags um, and identify them and map them and go through the process. So it's like a, almost like a business analyst that you have to actually go through the process and map everything. And then from a data point of view and data scientists now come and say, okay, how can I automate what part? What are those sort of a causation that we talked about? What, if this happened, what happened? Is that actually a red flag or is just something that I need to kind of highlight it, but it doesn't matter. Sean, do you want to add anything on, uh, about this um, slide? No, I think what you're saying is that um, where we're looking at statistical expertise, um, it's equally as important as some of the automation, maybe data engineering skills. Yep. Um, and then I think adding that sort of business lens, sort of why are you doing these data science initiatives and getting them to critically evaluate it. Um, and they might need some education in, in how to sort of operate in this space. Um, if you can combine those three things equally, um, then you can get to some really good value, I think. 
Um, and then I think you've highlighted, you know, communications and soft skills are sort of really important to how you might thread those three things together. Yep. Yep. Um, so I'm just going to be, um, sh I'm going to shift the gears a little bit and focus a little bit more on the finance um, side of the um, data science application and just go through a few of the things that um, I thought might be value to our community members to see um, different side of the data science in the practical side, uh, kind of aspect of it in financial services um, and finance industry. So um, the use of, kind of analytics in finance can cover so many different areas. For example, risk analysis, and I'm gonna go through each area very briefly just to give you a little bit of a, a hint and example. Um, so for example, um, risk analysis, real-time analysis, um, that's a big thing now because um, in the past that was a little bit of a challenge and that lag and delay sometimes was made in making the, um, the output and the insight not so much insight anymore. They were kind of outdated insights. Um, customer data management, I'll cover that in, in, in the sort of a financial industry. What does that mean? personalized services, uh, financial fraud detection, and algorithmic um, trading. Um, so in terms of going through each of these area risk analysis, um, um, every company has some risk while doing businesses and um, it has become um, essential to analyze the risk before taking any decision. So um, risk management frameworks and uh, having a risk um, um, risk analysis matrix and issue register and so forth are uh, vital to any uh, organization, especially a financial um, um, institution, um, because then you have different type of risk that can eventually uh, become a, a bigger problem for that institution. And I think um, if, uh, you know, community members might remember um, in 2018 and um, early 2019, when Royal Commission in Financial Services and Banking was happening, a lot of um, this discussion was um, um, sort of happening at a time around uh, the misconduct in financial services and banking. And now looking back, you think that how could that be um, avoided or maybe um, at least minimized? Um, so analyzing the threat, uh, the threat um, has become crucial for large companies um, for the strategic decision making. Um, and this is called um, risk analytics. So for business intelligence and data science in finance, um, analytics has become vital areas. Um, now you point out a very important things um, before um, shown about, um, you know, the raw data and data wrangling and so forth. So in the in financial also industry, we, we get to have a lot of raw data that majority of consists of unstructured data, uh, which you cannot necessarily insert into a standard Excel spreadsheet or a database. Um, so that's how the data science uh, scientist um, kind of plays an important and significant role um, in using their frameworks to analyze the data and make it actually usable and, and meaningful in a way. Um, uh, as you can imagine, um, you know, when you go to a bank and you start filling a form or an application, you put a lot of information, a lot of sensitive personal information, but not all those information can be used directly. So that's the role of a data scientist to be able to kind of decode it and make sense of it uh, for, um, for someone in that space. So then they can use the data to, to help the customer. Um, so in terms of risk analysis, how can you manage the risk? Um, I think we kind of touched on that and the causation bit that we need to understand what's the origins of the risk first. What are the uh, variables or the cause of it. Um, and then we find the threat. So we identify the threat and the problem. Um, now we come and monitor the risks. So uh, once we identify it and we, um, and we kind of um, uh, describe the origins of it, now we can understand what's the impact of that risk in organization. Now we can monitor it, we can prioritize it. In that space, um, yeah, the company can um, use massively available uh, data like financial transactions um, and customer information um, uh, using uh, which they can create a, score, a scoring model and optimize the cost. Um, so again, that's the role of a, um, a, a data that plays into the financial services of data scientists. 
Um, and this is an essential aspect of risk analysis and management, which is used to verify the credit worthiness of a customer. Um, so um, in terms of the risk management, that's how, um, you know, and then probably for the for our community members, that can be a tangible thing that you may want to go and, you know, buy a car or um, get a credit card. And they um, tell you that they have to run the credit report to be able to um, and tell you that if you can get that loan or uh, get that get that credit card or not. Um, so that's how they do by just running this um, sort of a risk analysis and making sure that um, where are you sitting in terms of a risk to their financial institution. Um, if the risk is low, you may get approved you know, within hours. If the risk is a little bit medium, they may ask you for further you know, documentation. If the risk is high, um, the application may get rejected. Um, so it's just a more of a tangible kind of uh, example of it. Um, and nowadays, many companies um, employ data scientists to analyze the credit worthiness of their customers using machine learning algorithms um, to analyze the transactions made by customers. Um, so you may go and, you know, uh, make a purchase or um, have a habit of, you know, spending certain amount of money on certain things and not really thinking too much about it, but the banks in the back, background are actually taking a note of all those behaviors and patterns and um, literally having a data kind of profile for you. And so when it comes to the point that now you want to go to the bank or financial institution for whatever reason it might be, then they go back and have a look and see what has been your, um, you know, kind of behavior um, in terms of financial behavior. And based on that, they make re um, relevant decisions. So do you um, have any questions so far on this? That sounds good. I think there's probably the blunt um, way of looking at it in other organizations that they've made to prevent um, employee fraud. Um, they've made them take annual leave for a minimum of two weeks um, so they couldn't take it in blocks so that um, I guess the behavior of fraud could emerge outside of that. Um, but that's sort of a really ineffective way to manage that risk. Um, whereas understanding the patterns of behavior um, and evaluating and understanding of that um, is perhaps a bit more precise um, and um, perhaps more effective for the organization overall in managing employees as well. Yeah. Um, so kind of moving uh, forward, the next um, part in the, data, the application of data science in finance, uh, financial services or financial industry is the real-time analytics. Um, so in the earlier period, um, data were processed and analyzed in batches, uh, which uh, means one by one and not real-time. Um, it had a huge disadvantage of data uh, being old by the time it was processed and analyzed. Um, the decision taken on historical data will not be very helpful to or accurate. So by the time you actually had the insight, um, it was just too late or um, it wouldn't have been uh, valuable or you already missed the, kind of missed the boat in a way. Um, whereas now it is possible to access the data with minimum delay due to the development of dynamic data pipelines and advancements in technology. So um, I think you touched on that, Sean, about the, you know, the role of data engineers to be able to kind of build those pipelines um, for the business to be able to actually to, um, you know, leverage those insights um, down the track. Um, and also the tools and systems that we um, touched on before um, and cloud-based technology that makes it much more available now to have um, a real-time analytics. Um, the next one um, is a customer data management. So um, the HDFC Bank in India was the pioneer in introducing data analytics in the banking segment in India. Um, and this was started in early 2004. And back then, uh, the main idea was to um, just very simple kind of um, uh, project to segregate the active bank accounts and to make a decision um, on the inactive bank accounts. It took him a few years. Uh, it took a few years for the banking segment to get into the data science model, uh, but since then there has been a steady rise in the dependency. And I think we all can um, um, kind of share our experiences that you know nowadays you just open your bank um, app and it's going to give you a lot of 
um, insight as you know you're exp um, expanding um, um, spending uh, experiences and habits and so forth. Um, so the use of data science in banking was an kind of add-on um, back, um, you know, back in 2004 and before that, uh, whereas now it's become a necessity. So that you have to have a data um, scientist in your organization, in a financial institution to be able to actually draw, uh, drive, you know, initiatives and get those insights. Um, in terms of the customer data management, um, it's the other uh, part is managing customer data. So um, with the emergence of the uh, digital banking, um, almost everyone, um, every kind of sort of a Tom and Harry has got a bank account. Um, now, this has um, led to Zeta bytes and the other bytes of customer data being just sorted out on their bank's storage repository. Uh, but not all those, um, you know, um, data are going to be useful and relevant. Um, so data scientists helps banks to isolate the necessary, necessary and appropriate data and use them to predict customers' behaviors um, and interactions and preferences. So that's how um, we're going to um, kind of move on to the next slide, which is a personalized services. Um, especially after the global financial crisis or GFC um, in 2008, the use of data analytics in banking for customers, uh, predictions and fraud detections and financial advisors to identify and predict uh, market trends became more and more important. Um, so uh, banks and financial institutions have a lot of um, user data. Um, they know in and out of um, their customers, including complete personal details, income, spending patterns, purchase powers, investment risk, appetite, um, and etc. Um, now, how they use it, this helps um, them to um, have a qualitative predictions about customer requirements. I think that's where um, that's the kind of one of the reasons we wanted to have this session shown that we bring that. Um, he, the kind of human aspect of it, the behavior, the communication side into the data science. So you have all this data, what does that mean? Um, and um, it's sometimes it's, um, and please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but sometimes it can be more, uh, it's harder to make a qualitative predictions rather than the quantitative one, because you have to collect more data and you have to Kind of filter through them and make sure that any biases, any sort of, um, you know, um, misleading information has been, um, you know, sift through, and you have this kind of clean data that now you can run your qualitative predictions based on that. You yeah. you agree with that, Sean? Do you think that qualitative predictions would um, would it be different to produce quite quantitative predictions? I think the methods of analysis um, are very different and um, the qualitative view is definitely much more complex. Mm -hmm. um, I think the personalized service is quite an interesting area. Um, so if we're looking at a basic service such as um, the automation of um, first contact, um, it, it can be through um, different um, chatbots. Um, and that's a way to hopefully provide information to customers in a more timely fashion um, but I think earlier on, there are a lot of inaccuracies with that information and um, there was um, some insensitivity with how that information was portrayed as well. Um, so I think the example was um, where a customer was unknowingly chatting to a chatbot um, because it wasn't labeled as a chatbot. Um, the person basically said, oh, I need to you know, have a general conversation and um, it came out that this person was taking tomorrow off and um, the chatbot said, oh, I hope you have a wonderful day tomorrow. And um, the person replied back, oh, no, I'm attending a funeral. Um, so I think be very careful with how you label that it is a chatbot because there can be inaccuracies. Mm -hmm. And then addressing some insensitivities and in how you deliver information are really important factors. Um, they're sort of growth areas, I think. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting you mentioned that because um, around these personalized services, the last part is the customer um, segmentation, which I wanted to kind of touch on that. Um, it's classifying customers based on various factors. Um, so for example, as you mentioned, if it's just purely based on taking a leave and making an assumption that that's 
you know, going have fun, um, uh, then um, it's not going to serve customers <laughs> well. Um, so it's very important that those kind of factors had been picked correctly and maybe um, kind of drilling down into a further and further sort of a questionnaire or, a, or, a, or more um, information to be able to filter um, those kind of, you know, um, um, exceptions. Um, and one famous algorithm for kind of clustering in um, K-Min is an interactive grouping algorithm uh, that um, tries to find the ideal number of um, groups by executing the algorithm steps in um, loops. Um, so that's also been used in, um, in finance and banking for customer segmentation. Mm. The next one is the financial fraud detection. I think it's a very um, sort of a popular one and common one. Um, um, so it's uh, basically using the, um, the, the, the data scientist um, uh, visualizing proactively the um, customer's um, banking activities for any and uh, looking for any suspicious or malicious pattern um, and detect any fraud and provide customers with a high level of security. So um, I don't know if it ever happened to you, Sean, but um, sometimes, you know, you may um, have that odd purchase, uh, you know, you go out buy a fridge or whatever, and you may have to spend um, a little bit more than your usual um, sort of spend and you immediately get a, get a call from the bank that, oh, we just, you know, uh, we just noticed that you had an unusual um, transaction, just want to confirm if this is correct or not. Um, and that's a very um, good example of um, financial fraud detection. So before actually it get escalated um, and someone just kind of empty someone's credit card and, and the, the first, you know, um, sort of a trigger point uh, is that any unusual activity get uh, flagged and checked with the customer. So as much as you want to go towards, you know, AI and robots and all of that, um, humans still pay, play a huge role in validating those, um, you know, triggers and making sure that yes, it was me or, oh no, it wasn't me and yet please investigate it and make sure that everything is correct. So um, this is usually done by monitoring and analyzing their um, banking activities, um, uh, which um, I think um, we are all all kind of familiar with our um, bank transactions and we can have a look at it and um, sometimes you know it's good to just um, this is my kind of financial um, advisor cap that I'm going to put on for, for a minute sometimes it's good that actually you go and have a look at your bank transaction and um, maybe just have a quick anal um, analysis for yourself that what is your and um, you know spending patterns um, you know do you usually spend on for example technology on takeaways and food on, and car and you know home renovation and just get an understanding about you know um, how you are spending your money and maybe how you can optimize it. So right it's almost like an arms race for different banks to get this right. Um, the cyber security risk has definitely posed a real major threat. Yeah. Um, the number of transactions that we deal with online have doubled and tripled over the last few years. Um, there's an enormous amount of online activity that we take for granted and um, the utilization of data science in these processes is sort of like an arms race because it is a really good competitive advantage for any bank and um, a good way to add some really good value and reducing stress for customers too. Yeah. Um, in the next slide, Sean, I just want to bring everything kind of together. Now we talked about um, the role of data scientists in financial services and also we um, um, had your insight on that which I um, um, appreciate that Sean um, but we only we, as we, uh, I think you mentioned it as well as uh, we can see only um, 27 under 30 percent so from every three projects um, only one of them um, is successful which is a big drop if you kind of think about it in, in that way, rather than just, you know, percentages. And maybe that's another way of, you know, a data scientist, how they, you know, visualize and demonstrate um, the data. So from every three, three projects, one um, is successful and two fails. Um, and we've kind of highlighted a few things here, but as we can see, the, the kind of biggest one is uh, wrong, inadequate skills. Sean, I think we talked about it, about the job description and so forth. Do you think that would have had any um, kind of role to play? What are your insights on that? Yeah, I think that there is a need for really good leadership in this space um, and that this is an emerging field um, still. 
um, and especially here in Australia compared to say the States um, that we're still sort of fumbling our way through. And um, I think leadership is so vital. Um, understanding what skills are required for a successful data science project is really vital. Um, there's, I think, a misconception in that, let's just hire a data scientist. Um, and um, there was a funny comment that I read um, uh, and it, it sort of gave an experience or insight into that area where um, they would hire a data scientist and they'll be working through a range of Excel spreadsheets, 15 of them to clump together 15 different data sources. And there's a real risk with that because you can't actually um, reproduce that analysis. So um, if that project is fortunate enough to be successful, how do you expand that out to a customer base um, offering recommendations potentially? Um, you can't actually productionize that. Um, or if you need to take away the learnings from that to improve the success of another project, um, it's not actually codified in a way that could be reproduced. Um, so I think not just the data scientists, but combining other skill sets, and I think some of these areas are sort of mentioned, is really important. Yeah, and one of um, uh, the other one that I wanted to kind of touch on is the management and cultural resistance. Um, that's also very important that, you know, what is the culture of that organization? Um, in theory, everyone are excited <laughs> that, you know, want to be forward um, sort of a thinking and having the latest um, technology on board. But in practice, um, that's when sort of the resistance starts coming to play. And I guess that's what, um, you know, see as a change manager, when you go into an in organization and you want to implement a change in the beginning, um, there is that kind of fear that what's going to happen to me, what's the impact on me? And, um, you know, am I still going to be able to do my day-to-day -day job or I have to do that on top of adopting a change and how much support I get? So. Um, it's very important to actually have a very supportive, um, you know, collaborative, forward-thinking uh, management and positive culture as well in, in an organization to be able to have a successful um, data science project. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and so it's saying that, so we um, kind of come to this point that data science success is not easy. <laughs> um, so in theory, it might be very sort of a streamlined but in real life, um, you have to go literally around the circle <laughs> so many times and um, uh, detangle a lot of, you know, um, area to be able to actually finally get to some point. Um, and even so, um, it might not necessarily be 100% success. Um, and this is kind of bringing these slides um, almost to the end that um, we wanted to show that how data science and the social science can work together collaboratively and very closely um, to be able to produce insights and produce, um, you know, um, outcomes for an organizations um, and for teams and projects um, that can be far, you know, more useful than someone just sitting in isolation and um, being almost um, sort of dictated that this is what you have to produce for me. If we have actually an opportunity to be able to talk to each other and understand, you know, business requirements and also the challenges from also the data science point of view. So what are the things that they need to be able to perform well? And what are the things that the business needs uh, from them? Um, if we can actually have that conversation, which I think that's um, another reason we have this community to be able to provide a platform for everyone to collaboratively talk to each other and talk about the challenges and ideas um, and help each other out. Um, saying that, let's go to the um, very last um, slide, Sean. Um, so we started with that slide and let's bring everything together. Um, so the data science is a team sport um, and um, we want to leverage the community in a way that um, Everyone has their own skill set and um, their experiences. They had their own, uh, you know, kind of career progression um, in their mind, or they might have, you know, vision it, um, how they can get there, 
how the community can empower them and help them to achieve that. Uh, we have a very, um, you know, um, diversified group of uh, professionals in the community from someone that um, might have been in the data science over 10 years for someone that is looking for entering into the data science space. Um, so it's a great opportunity for uh, people with uh, more sort of a tenure and more experience to be able to mentor and coach the one that are in more need of a, or in an earlier stage and they need a little bit more support. No, definitely. And I think that's also um, sort of doubling in different areas, um, getting an understanding of each one of those components. Um, and that might inform your level of specialization or um, understanding around how you might collaborate with resources in different areas. Yeah, absolutely. So you can actually perform better in your own role in your organization once you're understanding what's the role of you know, a data engineer in your team or a data scientist in your team or a, a business analysis and so forth. Um, so um, Sean, the next one is um, a little bit about the platform. Um, I'll let you um, drive it um, and um, how people can get um, the most out of the community. Yeah, a good question. So I guess um, part of this community is almost going into a room full of people and you don't necessarily know everyone. Um, within um, the platform, um, you can introduce yourself. I think it's a really good way to sort of tell others what you do and what you want to get out of the community as well. Um, there's been a really good response to that question as well. And a lot of this has been around, you know, how people can collaborate and share ideas and improve on their own capability as well. I think that's quite clear. Um, so within um, your profile, um, you can sort of enter that and add an introduction. So I think when you're going into a room full of people, it's a really good way to get to know other people and put yourself forward. And it's really easy to do. And um, I guess a few people have started to ask different questions as well. Um, so I guess there are other areas um, that I think are quite interesting. Um, food for thought. Um, some of those might be in this difficult time. Um, people might be wanting to find maybe a different occupation or um, a different skill set or a job. Um, so what are the steps to become a data engineer or a data scientist? Um, there's some really good questions to ask. And I think there are some people there that would be really eager to help step through that type of scenario as well. Um, other areas might be related to data governance or how do you scale AI in a production sense? Um, so as a data engineer, I've built a really great uh, model and now I really want to scale that to produce recommendations for tens of thousands of customers. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity there. That's great. Um... Thanks, John. I think um, you covered it all very well. I um, have nothing more to add. Um, I hope that the um, insight about the application of data science in financial services and finance, uh, financial industry was helpful to our uh, members. Um, I thought um, start off their lunch on with a very nice and easy topic um, and hopefully um, sort of tickled a little bit of inspiration and um, interest in everyone to um, sort of um, express their interest um, and feel free to reach out to me and um, send messages um, if you are interested uh, to be part of our future launcher um, and we can go through the selection process and uh, we are here to help you so if you need any help with the presentation uh, we are here to support you as well. Um, Sean thank you so much for your time um, and um, I really enjoyed our chat and um, discussion around the, the application of data um, science in financial industry. And I look forward to the future ones. Thank you so much. Thank you, Harif, for taking the time. It's really great presentation. No worries. Thank you. Thank See you, you everyone. Bye. Yeah.